So I'm on the couch with uh, Charlie Phillips. Very good to welcome you to the Martin Parr Foundation. Uh, so you were actually born in Jamaica, um, yes. and then you moved to England, I think we were in age 11. But do you have any memories of uh, your childhood growing up in Jamaica? Well, yes. I always say this, I'm a country boy. I was growing up in the par spent part of my life in the parish of St. Mary, um, where my Irish, some of my Irish ancestors, ancestors settled in a place called Clonmel. Yeah? And we talk about St. Mary, as where Ian Fleming settled, Avagana, Noel Coward. Yeah, that's where they got their inspiration from. That's how James Bond all started well, by um, Ian Fleming. That's the same parish he settled in, that's where I'm from. Yeah, but uh, in a small village called Clonmel. Right. And, and they were, uh, we're part of a, um, Irish um, indentured laborers who was sent out there in the 17th century. Then we went to Kingston, and yeah, that's another story as well, yeah. before I came in. And then when the idea of moving to England came up, were you excited or apprehensive, or how did you feel about this potential move? Well, my parents came up before, yeah, and I was one of the kids. Um, we're talking on some of the passenger ships. I was one of the kids. Uh, after I had a fascination with ships, and I was one of the kids who was on the docks seeing people leaving for England. And they used to throw coins over, and I um, used to dive for it, you know, before it reached the bottom, yeah? And, yeah. and I used to run errands for people who were last minute shopping, like cigarettes, mint balls, sweets, etc. But I also had a fascination with chips as well, because I was in the Wolf Cub, I was in the Cub, and the Queen was coming to Jamaica. And I saw the Royal, I think, I, I think it was the Royal Yacht Britannia. Britannia. And it was since that I was fascinated with the sea. And when I came to England, I wanted to be either opera singer or a naval architect. But it didn't work out. And when you arrived in England, what did you make of it? I mean, were you surprised, disappointed? I was, I was now to me it was an adventure at the time. But looking back at it, I came here when I was about 10, 11. And... Um, Ended up in Notting Hill when it was a ghetto and uh, where the average family of four used to live in a double room and I was part of that era. Yeah, Windrush kids. Okay. So you settled in Notting Hill Gate. You did, a, you did some work in Notting Hill Gate, but what, what made you interested in photography? Did you see a particular book or go to an exhibition? How did, well, how did it, it, was a, it was, say, circa 1958 after the race riot. During that time, there was also a Cold War a big Cold War, and um, used to have a lot of GIs who used to come down for the weekends, but the Afro-American GIs didn't have any way to go where they'd feel welcome. They didn't. They weren't into going to the Lyceum or Abbotsmith Pally, and there was a place where they congregated in Douglas House. But they used to come down in um, Notting Hill, and we used to have what you call a lot of shabins or private house parties private house parties and um, my dad you know this is when he used to bring the whiskey and the American uh, Thunderbird and, the, and, the, and the, you know lots of uh, rhythm and blues records and we used to have some fantastic parties in the basement if you had a basement flat you know you'd open it up and anyway we made friends and this uh, GI he never he, he was stationed in um, um, Ricelip, Ricelip, right? That American, but and I Wickham, that was too, which was near to London, and they always they always come down for the weekend. The Afro American one, they used to hang around in Notting Hill, and one of them um, got so legless he didn't have no money to go back to his base, so he pawned uh, Co uh, Kodak Renata, Renetta, to my dad for fifteen shillings. Mm -hmm. He never came back and picked it up, mm -hmm. and also he left behind a. Uh, uh, a, a magazine, um, I think it was a Saturday Evening Post, and there was this amazing picture. I was glancing through, glancing through it, and it was called The Runaway. It was done by, later on I found out who the artist was, the graphic designer, it was done by a guy called North, Norman Rockwell. And I was fascinated by this picture because um, it was a family of four living in one room, and I thought, when I get older, I'd like to run away. Yeah, and that's why I joined the Merchant Navy for a while, you know. But that's, that's how I um, started 
I didn't really start taking photograph. I started taking photograph before with my Kodak Brownie. I used to do a paper round. There was this nice gentleman um, called Mr. Evans who, who served in the war, and he gave me some tips. But I used the uh, Bello cameras. I think it was a Volkswagen that which I which was found in the basement, and I would used to play around with that. I done my paper round and I got carried away in Boots Chemist. So I wanted Timothy White. There was a book called Do It Yourself Photography. Mm -hmm. I paid three and six for it. <laughs> and um, it was the days with the camera with the bell. He mm -hmm. took eight eight pictures on a yeah. roll of six twenty films or or one two seven films. I can't remember. But there was also this box in larger. You put the negative and everything comes out on a postcard. Yeah. So I used to mess around and I used to do it and sell it for tuppence and threepence and all that, yeah? And they used to have a shop called Wallace and Eaton. You get the reject uh, paper and uh, I'd cut it up to size and I just used to take it as fun. But mm -hmm. when it got serious now, when this American GI left, this Kodak Renata, mm -hmm. it was a 35 mil and uh, we got a little flash and I used to take photographs of... Um, the West Indian community, Afro-Caribbean community. Um, I never thought about seriously taking photographs at the time, but you must remember at that time we all intended to spend five years in England. So I mm -hmm. thought I'd start taking photographs, put it in an album, hoping one day when we go back to Jamaica we can show what life was like <laughs> in England. But it looks like I've overstayed my time. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, with this Kodak Renata, I just started taking photographs of my community and everything. And um, it went on when I left school. I spent some time in the Merchant Navy. But I wasn't taking photographs seriously till I was about 17, 18. I used to get involved in, um, there was a big uprising, you know. And I used to um, take photographs of the Shubins, house parties. Okay. It went on later on, when I was about 20, I started to take photographs of the CND marches, band the bomb, um, um, anti-apartheid, um, bits of everything, yeah? and it started out from there. Now, during the 60s, there was a big student uprising. There was a big student uprising, and um, I went to Paris with other radical youths at the time, you know, because growing up at that time, we wanted the revolution, so I was in solidarity, and uh, we went over to the big um, student march in Paris, circa 1968, mm -hmm. and I started taking photographs as usual, and um, there was a big riot, and I saw this French student got his head busted, and I got in panic, and I just packed up and started to hitchhike. I hitchhiked, and 12, two weeks later, I ended up in Rome. Ended up outside the Piazza de Spagna, and I saw all these crowd of people walking back. I didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. So I followed, and I think it was Elizabeth Taylor with Richard Burton. And this is how I became to do a bit of paparazzi work to survive with mm -hmm. your camera. It was about 68, 69. Yeah. And did you have an agent who was selling these pictures? How no, you... I never took photographs. In those days, I didn't have an agent at the time. I was just a young man uh, hitchhiking all over Europe and um, taking photograph uh, 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 as uh, survival. But lucky enough, it was the era when um, uh, coming to the end of La Dolce Vita epoca, mm -hmm. yeah? And I started taking photographs at some of the film studios. Um, I used to go around Piazza de Spagna, Via Condotti. That's where some of the celebrities wanted to have their photograph to be seen, yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, I photographed, um, you know, from Marcello Mastriani and Fellini. And some people took a liking to me as well, you know. Um, it started from there. Then um, I, I could take my things straight into uh, a, what you call editorial. Yeah? Well, my big break, a, a break came twice. Um, in one of the film studios, I think it was Chinichita, they were shooting a film called The Intercabili, The Untouchables and the studio caught a fire. Mm -hmm. So this is the first, it's the second photograph I've had published on, uh, in Il Messenger, I captured mm -hmm. it. I was there at the right time. But in the meantime now, 
it was the same era when they were making a lot of spaghetti westerns in um, in Italy. I used to have a lot of film extras who wanted their photograph taken to work in these spaghetti mm -hmm. westerns. So I used to come back with them forwards to London, and every time I come back to fo forwards to London, I take photographs of Notting Hill. You know, I wasn't commissioned, but I thought, yeah, it's gone over five years, maybe ten years. By this time, my parents re-immigrated to America. I didn't want to go to America, so I went back to Italy and, you know, hanged around. And then I started to get assignment for Vogue Italia, Harper's Bazaar, everything. But the actual Notting Hill Gate book didn't come out until much later, so why did it take so long to get that published? Okay. When I came back to England, all it, because I had two major exhibitions in Italy. Katia Bresson came to one mm -hmm. at Il Diaframma in Milano. Yeah, it was called Il Frustrati. I had another one in Switzerland and other small major art shows in Italy. Yeah? I don't know why I came back to England because I thought, well, I can come back with my portfolio, um, showed it around, and nobody believed I took it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Did you really take that? And, yeah, that was good. And I couldn't get no assignment. I, yeah, so I had to end up squatting, and um, I had to end up squatting. And the last assignment I'd done was four days before Jimi Hendrix passed away. I had a big collection of Jimi Hendrix because he used to um, he used to be in Notting Hill all the time. You know, he took a liking to me, and um, nobody believed I took it. <laughs> no, did you really take that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing with my, my same thing with my Muhammad Ali collection. It's still under my bed. When I used to show it around, mm -hmm. I said, oh, we're not interested. There's too many alleys, you know? I said, yeah. So I gave up, and, uh, and I lost a lot of my ca collection, not till 20 years later, I went to a oh, uh, uh, diner in Wandsworth, Smoky Joe's. Uh, I got requests from a magazine of some photographs for, for, for the Blue Beat era, and I had a lot of reggae, early reggae musicians amongst my collection, a lot of black fashion amongst my collection. And it was one of the magazines, I don't know which one it was, they wanted some, but some photographs. I was busy, I was busy. So I just gave them all a pile of photographs and the courier took them to choose what they wanted when they brought it back. Um, there was this guy in the restaurant, he was a counsellor at the time, and he saw these photographs and he said, my gosh, this is not a little when it was in the a ghetto. These are for historical use, so they got the grant from the Art mm -hmm. Council. I was still running my restaurant, yeah. and um, that's how the book Not Little Gate was okay. published. It was published by the Art Council. I never thought nothing about it then. Mm -hmm. I forgot everything about it after. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, ten years later, I thought I'd have a nice, peaceful life. All I wanted to do was spend more time on my, my, on my allotment mm -hmm. and, uh, and grow my tomatoes, catch up on my reading, Still haven't finished War and Peace. And this guy called Simon Sharma, he got me out of retirement because he wanted to put an exhibition on called Faces of Britain at the uh, National Portrait Gallery. And I guess that's where it all started again. They revived me. Then, um, then um, uh, a couple of years later, the Tate called me to do a review on um, Fox Talbot. And um, then recently, an American magazine, American website, uh, put on the blog me, who the F is Charlie Phillips? Mm -hmm. And this is how they, they yeah. got me out of retirement again, <laughs> you know, I'm here. When we were arranging to do this talk, uh, you said, uh, is this anything to do with Black History Month? Yeah. So if it was, you didn't want to do it? I didn't want to do it. Can you explain why? No, because I personally think um, uh, um, we're part of British history and we should be marginalised. We should be marginalised. And this is a conflict I get in all the time. Um, for instance, there's another guy called Roger Bean, and they always call me up in Black History Month because they've got some early photographs of Roger Bean in Notting Hill. They want my photographs mm -hmm. to compare with his from a black point of view. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I'm not playing the color game anymore, and I'm tired of ticking the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, sometimes this is why I prefer to do things from a grassroots level. That every year, every year, thank God, there's another, uh, f uh, not a friend, this was English guy called, he, he's passed away now, called Tim Burke. And every year he has, we have a Portobello Festival, which is a local festival. And I bring pictures out 
showing our community and everybody was amazed. And just says, how come you're not in none of the galleries? How come you're not? Yeah. So Tim said, don't worry, Charlie, I'll be your gallery. So the first year he made a gallery out of pallets. Yeah. The second year he, um, he made one out of milk crates. And we had an exhibition in the local area, but it got so big and overcrowded because mm -hmm. grassroots people, gra I, find, um, I find, you know, something wrong with the arts, art, with the culture. It's grassroots people, I would say, from, especially from a working class background. Um, I feel part of the culture is being controlled by a little cultural elites, yeah? And I'll say that without any apologies, big control, and nothing is shown from a grassroots level. Mm How -hmm. I got revived once a year, during the Portobello Festival, I had, I used to hang my photographs, thanks, I want to thank all the barber shops out there, the hairdressing shops, the garages, who was giving me a wall, and I used to have to hang it on the railings. One of your other projects is it's, taking pictures of funerals, yeah, which is very unusual because you don't see photographers take pictures of funerals. What gave you the idea to do this? No, well, how great or what? What gave me the idea is I've been doing funerals. Afro-Caribbean funerals is, is not just celebrating someone's death, celebrating their life. Now, we're coming up to the seventh. We're coming up, whether you like it or not, we're coming up to the seventh generation. And lots of it, our culture is being lost. How great or what? Was, was the main tune, and bless my soul, my saviour unto thee, how great is the main theme, yeah? There used to be a strong dress code, yeah? F 50 years ago, a strong dress code. There used to be certain traditions which we're losing now. And uh, one day I was looking through my archives and I didn't, I forgot everything about it. And I saw pictures I've done 50 years ago and compare it with fiddles these days. The dress code isn't there anymore. It's all in bright colors. Uh, How Great Thou Art was a team song. Do you know what's a popular song now? Go on. Frank Sinatra, I done it. Regrets, I might have few. I travel each and every by way. Oh, simply the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, simply the best. Mm -hmm. Or song, Luther Vanderos, song for my father. Yeah, and it shows you how after seventh generation, the tradition has gone out. Yeah? So I've recorded it. The beauty about that exhibition, which I'm pleased, yeah, is I never ever, f I didn't get photo editors. Mm -hmm. I had volunteers. We went to senior citizens, we went to young students, we went to kids, a pile of photographs, and we say, choose a photograph that you'd like to see exhibited. And that's how, yeah, it wasn't done by me alone. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened now, last week, they made a mural of one of my photographs and that was chosen by some of the senior citizens and it's on a big wall, yeah. So for the funerals, would you, uh, would you get invited and paid as a photographer, like a wedding? Well, well, or, in or my community, just... no, no, I've not just done it and give, give it away to friends because most of the people in the funerals, their friends or associates, yeah, but it got carried away after a while because in Notting Hill, most of the funerals you see is between Notting Hill and Brixton, and I have a, a you know, good relationship with the family or friends. Mm -hmm. It wasn't done commercially as well, you know? Yeah. But where it got worse now is the, the last few year, years, they used to call me the dead man's photographer, and that became very spooky. And uh, it wasn't about, yeah? So nowadays, when there's, I've got two big ones, got why isn't Charlie there, yeah? Yeah? And they called me the dead man's photographer. So that, that, that became very spooky. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and looking I think that's a unique position because you know, you're hear of wedding photographers. Yeah, you, yeah. You but, are an but, official no, funeral photographer. Yeah, but no, I'm, I'm not an official fidget, but I'm recording the moment because our history has been properly documented, I feel. Um, um, uh, uh, um, people like you know, general public didn't know people like us existed, but what I'm doing is documenting our community, mm -hmm. our community which has been given the proper place. And whether you like it or not, we're part of British history, we're part of British culture, and um, we should have given the proper space. And this yeah. is why I refuse to do Black History Month, right. because our history is all. Cool. Yeah. Yeah? Since Black Lives Matter, 
I think, uh, let me just finish this question. It seems it, it, it's part of what's made your career so, um, you know, come up so, so fast, don't you think? Would you, would you actually accept that that's been a big factor in your no, recent I would success? Accept. I, I would accept, yeah, but the institution has come to terms now because people have been asking about me and good, and, and it's the website, yeah. I'm surprised I have nearly, um, what, 6,000 followers, young people, young people. And they, um, like, our story hasn't been properly told. Last night I'd done a, another talk and some of the places I go, they call me Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie, because our story hasn't been properly documented. And I've done that through photography and oral, oral history. And this is a missing gap in our story, yeah, because the institution hasn't given us a proper platform to show our events. And this is why I refuse to do no, Black History. Yeah. Yeah, We've got I've, a I've never, I mean, you, you are very busy at the moment. You're doing talks everywhere. Not everywhere. It's, you know, at the end of the month, it's all over now. Okay. Yeah? Okay. We make redundant. I'll, call, I'll, call it black, I'll call it black working months. <laughs> yeah, when The Guardian did the thing about who's the, probably the best unknown photographer in Britain, and it was about you, I mean, that, that did a lot of good, didn't it? No, I was voted. I, I, I was nominated for the Deutsche Börse Award. I never got that. I was nominated as my time out as the best urban photography. Um, yeah. Nothing has been, you know, yeah. It's been controlled by a, a cultural elite. So I'd rather stick to my grassroots level, mm -hmm. ordinary people. Because when I go back to Notting Hill, Notting Hill, people honor me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, because I'm the only icon they've got. In fact, now they're putting up a mural, plan to yeah. put a mural up yeah. of me. Yeah. So, um, we take it from there. So recently you got a, a big grant from the Heritage Archive. I've lost a lot of my archives as well and we're trying to repair it and restore it and, uh, and there's more to come as well yeah because um, so some of my things have been in the way for the last 50 years which I completely forgot about and now I'm trying to go down to Italy to see if I can recover some of my things I've taken with the Dolce Vita because okay. when I brought it back to England people the most editors, a lot of editors couldn't believe I took it. Uh, in those times, we didn't expect Afro Caribbean to be a photographer. Right. But I made my name in Italy. Yeah. 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 So, for this archive that you're creating, will it be open access to the public? Yes, will there be a new book coming out? Or well, I'm, well I'm not, I'm, I'm, what, what I'm doing now, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of, I'm, I'm tired, Martin, I'm tired of, of knocking at doors, mm -hmm. yeah? Tired of knocking at those, so if I do anything, I'm doing it myself yep. because, yeah, because you always get the stereotype black books doesn't sell, so I've done it myself, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, um, uh, not in the gate of the 60s, it's sold out, but the publisher has decided to have a reprint, you know, mm -hmm. and that's it. So, you have to do everything mm -hmm. yourself. I'm tired of knocking at doors, okay. and um, and um, the, uh, but I just hope the institution will come to their senses to acknowledge people like myself exist. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 So you, you feel very positive about the future now, do you think? No, not really, no? It, it, no. no. it changes, yeah. Mm -hmm. If anything comes up, comes up. But one of the things that keeps me going is there's lots of young kids out there, both black and white, you know, because I've spoken in, in um, arts colleges and some of the white kids, it makes me feel good. So we didn't know people like you existed. No, seriously. So really? it shows there's a lack. Yeah, mm -hmm. shows shows you um how uh, maybe the arts or the culture has been very elitist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know we keep it from a grassroots level. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, some of the big institution only I think I've been sometimes I think I've been used as a political pawn mm -hmm. to tick the box. Nothing else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They'll never call you out for anything when it suits them. You know, when, they, when it has to tick the box or they apply for their grants and they have to, what do you call it, inclusion. Yeah. Um, but do you think it's getting better? Because when you first hmm. arrived in Britain, the, the, the racism that you'd find in the streets was pretty bad. And it has, I think it has improved somewhat. It has improved, but not fully improved not fully. because, because uh, you know, I go out here now and I'm probably be more likely to get stopped. And questioned for no unknown reason, yeah? Mm -hmm. But it still happens.
let's face it. Okay, Charlie, thank you very much. My that's pleasure, brilliant. Martin. Yeah. I've never I've spoke like this for a long time. <laughs> no, that's great. I don't have to see my psychiatrist yeah, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah.